be muted upon entry. We encourage participants to use the chat function for questions or comments throughout our uh, the, the whole session today. We want to hear from you and hopefully we will address any questions you have for today. So today's moderator, uh, Ariba Ken, project manager of the Core Lab at Northwell House, and she's also the co-chair of the Asian Bridges Bird. With her, we have Dr. Alison Myers, the mem uh, she's also a member of the African American Caribbean Bridges Bird, and she's also the assistant professor of the Institutes of Health Innovation and, uh, and Outcomes Research at the Feinstein Institutes of Medical Research at Northwell House. So now I would like to invite Maxine Carrington, who's our senior vice president, the chief uh, human resource officer at Northwell House to provide executive remarks for today's event. Maxine? Well, yeah, thank you Chandler. And, th and thanks everyone for joining today. I uh, really appreciate as I look at uh, the number of folks and growing uh, participants today, uh, you're truly committed and we appreciate your time. Uh, so May is Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month. I'd be remiss if I didn't also highlight that it's Jewish American Heritage Month. Um, and so reflecting on comments uh, approaching today, um, I saw a screensaver. So it, for our Northwell team members, one of your screensavers flashing across your screen, if you sit at a desk or use a computer, it says celebrate AAPI Heritage Month. Um, and I think often about the word celebrate being used in the context of our diversity uh, inclusion recognition months. And then I think about what we mean by celebrate. Uh, so we don't mean party. Uh, we don't mean food festivals. Uh, this is not about <laughs> consuming, uh, consumerism of culture. Uh, so for example, one might be comfortable with uh, eating at their favorite uh, Asian American restaurant this month and thinking they've done it, they've arrived, they've connected somehow with the people and the culture. Um, by celebrate, we mean valuing. Acknowledging, learning, respecting the history, which is a rich history, uh, legacy, achievements, contributions uh, of this group uh, to society and to culture, and I'd say all over the world, as we know. And I would also say it's important, uh, obviously, to do that every day, uh, not just during a month. And even more so critical as we support this community in the face of, uh, I won't say growing, because the ignorance has always been there, uh, but growing violence, for sure. And so we are so grateful uh, for the panelists today uh, and a diverse uh, panel, I might say. So thank you for that and to our Bridges Asianberg for creating this space. Uh, it's so important for us to keep connecting and keep learning. It's something that we view as our responsibility at Northwell, uh, definitely as we work to be better al allies, but as Michael Dowling always reminds us to be global citizens, uh, learning is key. And so just wanted to say thank you all, looking forward to uh, the discussion and uh, to everyone, uh, definitely enjoy the experience and let's hear from you today as well. Uh, so thanks all and uh, may all go well, thank you. Now we want to uh, just pass it back to our moderators to, to kick off today's discussion. Good afternoon, and thank you for those wonderful words, uh, Ms. Carrington. And uh, you are absolutely right. I have taken the time this month to spend a lot of time learning more about Asian American history, as well as the intersection between Asian American and African history. There's a lot there that you may not find in routine history books. So we definitely all need to learn about each other's cultures and also learn about how we've worked together for centuries. You know, a lot of times people think of the African slave trade only coming here to the US, but Africans were actually taken across the Indian Ocean as well. And there are actually African populations in places such as Sri Lanka, in the Gujarat region of India and other parts of Asia. So definitely right that we all need to learn about the history because there's also a lot of overlap amongst our histories. And now I have the pleasure of introducing three wonderful people that are gonna share more about this on today's panel uh, with my esteemed co-host, uh, Ms. Ariba Khan. Uh, we have uh, someone who actually represents my district, so I'm really I'm happy that we have her here today. And that is the U.S. Representative Grace Mung, who is from the best place on earth, Elmhurst, Queens, where you can get all the amazing diverse food from throughout Asia, uh, where you can get so much great culture. Um, you were raised in Bayside as well as Flushing. You went to that other high school, Stuyvesant, but I won't hold that against you. I'm a hunter, right? <laughs> and you also went to University of Michigan undergrad, and you got your law degree from Yeshiva, and you've pretty much spent your career working for the little people, trying to help people of color, poor people, 
whether it's um, people in low income housing, um, whether it's removing the term, the derogatory term oriental from federal laws um, and making parts of our history in Queens um, become historic. You are also the first Asian American who has represented um, the member as a member of Congress from the state of New York. You previously also served as an assemblywoman and you are now serving on the House Appropriations Committee as vice chair of its subcommittee on state and foreign relations. So pretty impressive, impressive career. And again, as one of your constituents, I'm really impressed with the work you've done and I really greatly appreciate that. We also have Dr. Kim Owen, who uh, she has, we said we will call her Kim for today's purposes, who's also done a lot of great things. She's currently working with a race racism as a researcher and policy analyst. She received her PhD in sociology earlier this year at the University of California, Irvine, with a specialization in racial inequality and public policy. But her passion for racial justice started almost two decades ago when she moved to Atlanta from Saigon, Vietnam. That's a big change. Uh, growing up and seeing the stark contrast between the well-funded Druid Hill um, high schools, which is nested in a wealthy white majority neighborhood, and the marginalized Clarkston High School, located in her own low-income refugee and Black majority neighborhood, it left a very strong impression that later inspired a lifelong journey in combating the various ways that racism manifests, particularly in education and housing. She's excited to bring her research skills back to the nonprofit world and help craft data-driven campaigns around policies. And last but not least, we have the Reverend Dr. Richard O. McEachern, who is an interim elder in the African Methodist Church, having pastored First Hempstead AME Church in Hempstead, Long Island, and Bethel Tabernacle AME Church in Brooklyn, New York. He now serves as the pastor of Macedonia AME Methodist, I'm sorry, African Methodist, also known as AME Church in Flushing, New York. And he looks forward to leading the congregation into a new millennium of spirituality and church growth. The Reverend currently serves also as president of the Macedonia Plaza Community Development Corporation, where he is responsible for leading leading the corporation in the development of 143 units of affordable housing, something we really need here in New York. Um, it is a $45 million project that was completed in December 2014. He is a native of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. He earned his Bachelor of Science at one of our, one of our amazing HBCUs, North Carolina. Agricultural and Technical University in Greensboro. He also has received his master's in divinity degree and doctor of ministry in urban ministry from the New Brunswick Theological Seminary in New Brunswick, New Jersey. He's been actively involved in many community civic associations as well as fraternal organization Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated. He's also a member of Community Planning Board 7, member of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce, the member of the Board of Trustees of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the Board Examiners for the New York Annual Conference, as well as the Ministerial Alliance of New York City and Vicinity and the NAACP. We are so happy to have all of these amazing panelists today. And now I'll turn it over to my co-host, Mr. Reba Khan. Thank you, Dr. Myers. It's truly an honor to have all of you here today. And we only have an hour for today's session. So let's dive right into our first question for our panelists. Um, before I get into that, though, I just wanted to define the term Asian American. According to the U.S. Census, um, it comprises of over 50 ethnic groups speaking over 100 languages. Um, descendants come from areas like China, Japan, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, Vietnam. And the term Pacific Islanders, uh, descendants are included from Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, and other Pacific uh, islands. And in celebration of Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, uh, Representative Grace Mang, we would love to hear about you know, some about, some about the key milestones or contributions that AAPIs have made throughout American history. And fast forward to today, how we're, we're continuing to make strides in history in legislation and government. And maybe you can speak to you a little bit about your experience considering you are the first Asian American to be elected in Congress in the state of New York. Well, first of all, thank you Northwell for hosting this event and for bringing us together, even though it's just virtually, I hope we can meet in person one day uh, to one of my favorite participants. I have to say that she's my constituent, Dr. Myers. Thank you for your work. And by the way, your school hunter is a lot harder to get into than mine was, so you can brag. <laughs> Um, thank you, Cam, for your uh, inspirational work in Georgia, which in so many ways sets the tone for the rest of the country. Um, and I just uh, really appreciate so much of 
the beauty and the struggle that is going on in Atlanta on, on so many levels. Um, to one of my favorite people in this world, uh, Reverend Dr. McEachern, um, thank you for your leadership. I mean, we're here to talk today about allyship. This is what uh, Dr. McEachern does uh, every single day um, in the historical community of Flushing, Queens. Flushing, which was one of the birthplaces of religious freedom. Uh, Flushing, which was a stop on their Underground Railroad. Uh, Reverend McEachern has literally fought to feed and to house people of all backgrounds in our communities in Queens. And I think the last time we saw each other was uh, at a celebration for Juneteenth um, last year. Um, so thank you so much for your friendship and your um, leadership, Reverend McEachern. Um, of course, I spoke so much, I forgot the question. Um, but. You know, this, this is really a, 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 an interesting time in our nation's history. Um, so many hearts have been broken over the last year, not just from the COVID-19 pandemic, but we've literally witnessed the expansion of two uh, incredibly important movements for both the Black and the Asian communities. And I will say as someone who um, was born and raised here in Queens, I've never seen such a widespread showing of support for Asian Americans from people who don't look like me and from people who don't necessarily share the same background as me. And that really gives me a lot of hope. Our parents and our grandparents each struggled in their own ways um, in this country and in this city. They don't necessarily have the tools in their toolbox to build and to strengthen these coalitions. And it's literally up to all of us, you and me, as we make history here together. Over this last year, as our communities were battling COVID, um, we also engaged in important rallies and protests and important conversations with our own family members and own community members. As we saw diverse turnouts at Black Lives Matters protests, we had many conversations between Asian American youth and their parents who asked why they were at BLM protests. And so this sort of opened up a very necessary um, avenue of communication that many people um, think is really long overdue in this country. We live in such a diverse community, but too often live, work, and exist in, in, in our own different separate silos. So right now, I'm really trying to see the silver lining in, in, in all of this, um, having these um, tough conversations, finding ways Recently, the national NAACP president said, you know, you got to be a friend before you need a friend. And I think that just really represents so much of what change and, and beauty we are seeing now between and amongst our shared communities as we learn more about each other's histories in this state and in this country, which we really don't know enough about and learn that we have so much more in common with each other and that we can work to mutually support each other. Um, and so, you know, I, these are the silver linings uh, that I see. Absolutely, great, sweet. We appreciate your leadership and, you know, we're, there's progress made, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and like you said, change starts, you know, with us. So I want to kind of pivot towards talking about um, what you kind of touched upon about discrimination and racism towards the AAPI community, which unfortunately is not new. We have seen an uptick of anti-Asian violence and racism during the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, a lot of these were due to the xenophobic narrative surrounding the virus. Um, and in fact, there, there's a statistic out there by, um, there's an organization called Stop AAPI Hate, which tracks reports of hate crimes. Um, from March, 2020 to March, 2021, reports increased from 3,795 to 6,603. And this includes verbal harassment, physical assault, civil rights violation, and online harassment. Um, so Dr. Kim, I'd like to pivot to you. Um, you know, it seems like in these times, it seems like there's been more attention paid to incidents between the Asian and black communities, which is truly detrimental because there's in fact, there's, there's history of solidarity between the two. Um, can you provide some historical context in terms of maybe public policies or narratives that might have pit, pitted these communities against each other 
um, in the past and around these the, around the root causes of what we're seeing today and how in fact these you know the Asian and black communities have actually worked together in solidarity. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think uh, I wanted to have a quick disclaimer and I think Dr. Um, Myers touched on this in the beginning that you know a lot of times when we think about Asian and black communities, we tend to think that they don't overlap, right? But obviously there are black Asians. Um, and you know even um, Vice President Kamala Harris um, is from her her mother is from India, right and her father's from Jamaica. So again, there's this idea that, Again, we, we need to be rooted ourselves in the common understanding that race is social construct. It's not biological. It's not something that is real, even though it has real social consequences, right? So, you know, let's say if for the purpose of this conversation, I want to talk more about communities that are racialized by our society as Asian. So that a lot of times, you know, exclude black Asians. Um, and then communities that our society racializes as black. Um, so, so in that sense, I think it all comes down to anti-Blackness, right? Wherever there's an instance of, let's say, hate crime against an Asian person per per perpetrated by a Black person, the media amplifies it a lot more. Whereas when you see that when the hate crime is amplified or is committed by a white person, then the media downplays it, right? Whether using the idea of mental illness, whether using even ignoring it, even just saying, oh, maybe it's not about race. Um, so again, I think this is rooted in anti-Blackness and how Black communities are racialized in a criminal way or criminalized to begin with. Um, so, so on that end, um, you know, I think that that's, that's an important way to think about it. It's not that they care about Asians, it's that they, you know, want to criminalize Black people further. Um, and when we talk about the history of solidarity, I think it's important to not fall in the trap of invisibility. So on the one hand, you know, some people fall in the trap of invisibility by saying that there's always been conflict, there's never solidarity. And on the other hand, there's the myth of invisibility where, oh, the two communities have always worked together and kind of ignore the fact that again, community, communities racialized as Asian do benefit from anti-Blackness. And a lot of times we have actively um, utilized that anti-Blackness to our advantage. Um, so, you know, I think I was lucky in that my first job out of college um, was working in, in New Orleans East. And it was a multiracial um, organization working on, how, um, working on education equity. So I was lucky to be in a space where that itself was the solidarity with, between Vietnamese youths, Black youths, and um, Lat Latinx youths working together um, on a host of issues in terms of education equity, in terms of dealing with how charter schools left a lot of kids behind, in terms of um, lack of language access, in terms of racial discrimination that Vietnamese and Latinx youths faced. So an example um, was that for one of our campaigns, even though this issue didn't affect a lot of the black youth, they were a part of a lot of demonstrations, they were a part of a lot of the actions where um, we found that um, charter schools in New Orleans discriminated against Vietnamese and Latinx youth by automatically enrolling them into ESL classes. So English as second language classes. So the idea was that administrators just saw a non-English name um, and assume that these young stu students didn't speak English, right? So they put them into those classes and which then had huge consequences in terms of their later education directory. Um, again, even though these students were born here, even though they spoke and wrote and read English well, um, there was that assumption. So that was a campaign that um, we did the research for um, that again, Black views joined um, the campaign, even though it didn't affect them per se. Um, so that's just one example um, of a long history of solidarity, right? I think currently we see um, the fight um, to, to protect a fur of action. So I think this is where you can kind of see the complicated history that on the one hand, we do see some Asian led groups trying to dismantle affirmative action. But on the other hand, we also see Asian led groups joining black, uh, black led groups to push for um, affirmative action to be protected. Um, and yeah, so I think in that sense, we should 
look at the whole host of history and kind of sit with the nuances and not try to gloss over one side or the other. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop now um, on, on that question. So Asian hate crimes have been something that have been ongoing. Um, a lot of people think that Atlanta was the first time that something like this has happened. But let's look back at 9-11 when a lot of the Sikh Indian community was actually being terrorized because people did not know the difference between people who are Muslims in this country, people who are Sikh, and not to say that we needed to attack Muslim population, obviously, that's not where I'm going. But there were a lot of Sikhs who were actually violently beat up here in Queens and in other parts of the country due to what happened around 9-11. So now, unfortunately, fast forward another 20 years, we're coming, it's coming to the stage again, we're around COVID, we're seeing this uptick of Asian hate crimes. So uh, U.S. Congresswoman Grace Meng, can you talk more about the role of developing this COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act um, in which the Senate finally passed and that what you pretty much put together and what do you envision that this will do to help combat anti-Asian hate and what are the next steps of this legislation? So thanks for the question. This legislation was passed by the Senate a few weeks ago and hopefully will pass the House um, sometime this month. This legislation does a few things. It provides funding for local community groups like the Stop AAPI Hate that was mentioned. Our local groups, and Cam knows this, has really been on the front lines of doing a lot of the work that government, quite frankly, should have been doing. From translating materials, some of my constituents didn't even know that we were under quarantine in the first few days because they don't necessarily watch cable news network or, or you know, read mainstream papers. And so, you know, in this time, Time of, of what's almost like a war, we need to make sure we're able to support the organizations that are reaching out to our everyday community members. It would uh, provide uh, more data uh, to the Department of Justice. Right now, most hate incidents of any community um, are not reported to the federal government. So similarly to a public health crisis like gun violence, uh, we need more data. We need a more complete and accurate set of statistics so we can more holistically address uh, the problem. It would provide guidance for local law enforcement on making it easier for these incidents to be reported. Um, in New York, for example, we always tell people to go report it, but it's not always so easy. People might not feel comfortable going to a police station. People might not know English. People might be disabled. People, there was a case where someone was literally on her way to work when something happened to her and she couldn't be late to work. So. Are there ways that we can make it easier for people to report either online or in multiple languages? Um, I will say that one thing that, you know, not everyone agrees with me, but hate crimes legislation alone is not going to solve the problem. We're not going to prosecute our way out of this. The goal is not to lock more people up. Necessarily, not every hate incident is a hate crime. So this is something that is at the back end um, of what uh, we need to do to help the community. But on the front end, you know, community health programs, mental health programs, uh, strengthening the social network, um, education, that is also a huge piece um, of what needs to be done. This is, there's going to be a very long road uh, ahead of us. Um, and then passing this legislation uh, is one piece of it. Thank you. Reverend Mick Akram, Rear Church Macedonia AME is in the heart of an Asian, Asian community in Flushing. Can you talk about what you've been seeing or hearing from the community regarding the anti-Asian violence and what have been some of the actions of the community has taken in response to this? Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Kim, Ms. Khan, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, thank Northwell Health for hosting this event and for allowing me to participate in this important discussion on building solidarity through allyship. Um, I'm truly and uh, honored and delighted uh, to share this panel uh, discussion with my good friend, um, Congresswoman Grace Ming. What I'm seeing and hearing uh, from the community regarding anti-Asian violence is anger, remorse, and frustration. Uh, many of us were shocked and outraged uh, when we learned of the mass shooting in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, we mourned the lives lost in the killing of eight people, including six um, Asian American women. Uh, many of us were angered 
by the recent violent attacks against Asian Americans in Flushing and Chinatown and in other parts of the country. Um, we've seen the, elder, the elderly and others violently attacked while walking on the streets or in the subways. Uh, these, these attacks hit home for me um, when I saw in the news an elderly Asian woman being attacked in an area of Flushing that I was familiar with. Uh, so that would hit, that hit home for me. Um, uh, many of us are frustrated, frustrated by what we are becoming as a society and what seems like this acceptable behavior uh, to racism, violence, and hatred. Uh, but in spite of all of what we see, we, we do see community groups uh, coming together and taking action. Uh, community leaders, activists, and residents are building coalitions and we're speaking out against anti-Asian hate. Uh, so there's, there's a, um, a wide range of emotion. Uh, and I think um, not only in, in Flushing, but in, I'm also in, I'm in, in two locations, uh, Flushing and in Southeast Queens. Um, but I do see people coming together. I do see um, people uh, taking a stand and speaking out uh, within the community. So it, it seems like the COVID-19 um, Hate Crimes Act empowers our citizens to speak up and to report you know, more about what's going on, what they've experienced. Um, Congresswoman Grace, can we talk about the flip side of it where, um, can you talk about future legislation ideas you plan on working on or might be working through that includes addressing racial inequity and violence by enfor law enforcement or additional legislation that takes more of a preventative approach uh, for preventing racism and hate incidents uh, towards Black and Brown, Latinx, and other marginalized communities? So two bills that I'm more directly involved with, um, one uh, related to this issue in general on, on the issue of mental health, trying to figure out ways where local law enforcement um, and local municipalities can train more mental health experts to respond to emergency situations. Uh, many of the 911 calls that come through uh, are actually mental health related. Um, about 25 to 30% of the attackers in New York of these anti-Asian hate incidents um, also have mental health issues. So whether it's for the perpetrator or whether it's for the victims, um, our government at all levels need to invest more uh, robustly into mental health programs. This is something that is not a new problem, of course, but especially after COVID is something that we really need to focus even more on. Um, another issue that I'm working on is just to uh, provide more diverse curriculum for our students uh, at the K through 12 levels. This is something that, you know, I've been trying to participate just on my uh, own time with, you know, leaders around the city from Black, Latino, Asian communities. And what we found out is that there oftentimes different communities don't really know a lot or don't know enough about each other's experiences, our histories, um, our, the trauma that different communities have faced in this country. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are uh, providing for a more complete and accurate teaching of American history in this country. Um, we did not learn enough uh, as a kid about the Chinese Exclusion Act, Congress literally passing laws to prevent people who look like me from becoming citizens. Uh, we didn't learn enough about Japanese American incarceration camps. We didn't learn enough about the Chinese community and the black community in Mississippi, uh, the death of Vincent Chin and slaves building the US Capitol, the very place where I work every single day. Um, and so I think, you know, a huge part of what we need to do in the long term in addressing and breaking down the walls of biases and stereotypes, you know, we need to better understand where we come from and how our, you know, uh, our experiences in this country and what we have contributed, our communities have contributed to this country for too long. Many communities of color have been on the defense trying to make our experiences fit into what we think 
uh, constitute a, a real American. Um, and what I learned from Atlanta, and I um, spent some time with uh, the families of the victims, I had gone to visit them. What I learned from them and them talking about their families and their stories was that we need to be proactive. We are proud and confident of our history and our experiences uh, in this country and that we are all just as American uh, as anyone else. That's really well said, thank you. Um, I know you have a busy schedule today and you need to leave soon. But before you go, I'd like to invite the audience um, to ask a few questions and provide comments for Congresswoman Grace. Um, you know, you brought an important point that, you know, talking about the, you know, each individual story about the immigrants, you know, people that have come here, everyone's story is so unique. But in, in terms of the classroom setting, we don't really talk about it enough. Um, and AAPIs have made tremendous contributions in different sectors, you know, ranging from economical growth, healthcare and sciences, arts, entertainment, and even government. Um, so, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. It's really important. So if we don't have any questions uh, from the chat right now, I will uh, continue on with some of my questions. So this question is for you, uh, Cam. Can you discuss some of the issues that can occur when AAPIs are viewed as a monolith? I, we mentioned earlier that there's probably 150, 160 different Asian groups here, um, but very often it's this umbrella of just Asian American. Um, can, and also, can you discuss the term data disaggregation and what's needed to do to better evaluate the needs of the different AAPI communities? And I think a good example is for um, is with COVID. A lot of people we, we focused on the fact that Black, Latino, and Native Americans were being uh, killed most disproportionately, but there was a large number also Filipino Amer Americans that were also dying out that weren't really reported, and others uh, um, Southeast Asian groups. So if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a very important question. Um, I think, I mean, obviously the, the biggest harm is the harms done to the, the groups, right? And so, you know, I think, um, I think earlier I was talking about, I was mentioning and kind of emphasizing the point that again, race is the social construct. And as a result, you know, no group is a monolith, right? When, you, when you're talking about Muslims, when you're talking about black Americans, when you're talking about land access, any kind of group, you know, Jews, Buddhists, any kind of group you want to talk about, there's always, we need to keep in mind of this push against painting them as a monolith. Um, and in terms of the AAPI community, you know, and even sometimes people talk about less, even disaggregate the Asian American from the Pacific Islanders, right? Because a lot of times Pacific Islanders are not really um, represented when, when Asian um, communities discuss issues. Um, and you know, and so in terms of diversity, which you like geography, there's South Asians, and then there's East Asians, there's Southeast Asians, and even when you're talking about um, a country of origin, let's say Vietnam, where I came from, um, we need to also think about the nuances, right? That not all Vietnamese person is someone that's going to look like me. We also have indigenous groups living in Vietnam, dealing with racial, um, dealing with inequality within Vietnam, and then coming to the U.S. And, you know, when people talk about, well, let's have um, um, materials in Vietnamese, a lot of times that leaves out the indigenous groups in Vietnam themselves and even make them feel like they're not Vietnamese. Um, so that's an example of how much disaggregation of the of commu Asian communities that we need to do. Um, and that's not even to touch on religions. You're not talking about even like socioeconomic status, right? Like for me coming to the US um, on like a family reunification visa, it was very different from my uncles who came to the US as refugees. Um, and very different, like very different from my parents who came to the US and not having access to education that I did. Um, and so, you know, um, our, in terms of life outcomes, we're very different. And then we're talking about genders, right? Like for example, talking about um, the hate crime that was committed that was specifically towards Asian women um, in, in, a, in that sense. And then um, other kind of gender identities such as transgender individuals. So we know we have a lot more statistics now in terms of how black transgender women or um, 
at a disproportionate rate in terms of being killed and being murdered. But, you know, I'm trying to like look for data on transgender women, um, uh, Asian women, and a lot of times it's absent, right? Um, now, increasingly, there's been a big push to um, collect that data. So, you know, my actually my dissertation only was possible because political scientists, because sociologists were starting to collect data on the different Asian groups. Um, and we, we need that on a larger scale and we need that done by the government, not just by community groups. Um, like um, Representative um, Grace Monk said, that a lot of times the burden has been put on community groups. A lot of times it's put on children of immigrants ourselves um, and we need the government to really take that, um, that lead. Um, and you know, I think one thing I'll say um, before I close is that we, the the disaggregation is really important, not just for the outcomes of the group as a whole, but for different individuals, right? So when we talk about hate crime legislations, can we make sure that it's not going to further criminalize um, non-Asian populations, but also certain Asian populations, such as um, Asians who are Muslims, for example, um, Asians with darker skin tones. Um, so, so in that sense, I think we want to, to think on multiple fronts and be really careful as so that not, um, as so that in trying to help certain Asian communities, we further harm other Asian communities. Representative Meng, do you have anything else to add? Well, I just do want to, you know, echo what Cam's saying, you know, the Asian American community is not a monolith. Um, we need to be making sure at this time that we truly are reaching out to different communities and being good listeners. Um, disaggregation of data is so important. And sometimes even within our own community, Cam knows we get some pushback, but COVID, mental health, uh, diseases that specifically affect uh, our community in a disproportionate way, hepatitis, diabetes, we need to know the numbers. Uh, again, whether it's, whether it's health issues, whether it's gun violence, whether it's hate incidents, we need to have a fuller picture of the data and the statistics so that we can ask for more resources to address these issues and to provide solutions. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you all uh, to for having me here today and you know I didn't mention how incredibly grateful I am as a local representative for the whole Northwell family I know that you have all been through so much what we can't even imagine while so many were quarantining safely at home so many in the Northwell family couldn't and didn't and you all sacrificed so much uh, throughout the past year and uh, we are incredibly grateful to all of you. So thank you so much for what you do. Uh, thank you for this space. And let's continue to have more of these conversations. Um, I'm always around if you need me. Thank you, Grace. <clears throat> thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, and Reverend McEachern, uh, I have a question for you. You know, our communities, unfortunately, have had this long-standing history of not always seeing eye to eye. Um, you know, there have been instances in stores and things that have happened in, in our communities between the Asian and the Black uh, communities. So what are some of the ways that we can build the solidarity and act as allies for our Asian brothers and sisters? And what are other ways that people can continue to support such <laughs> efforts? Thank you. Well, I think forums like this always helps. Uh, it shows solidarity among uh, the different ethnic groups. Um, uh, there has been uh, issues in Flushing between uh, African Americans and, and, and Asians. Um, as you know, in downtown Flushing, there are many stores that are owned and operated by Asians. Um, and sometimes there's, they may be this feeling of displacement among African Americans in, in certain areas in, in, in Queens, where the, uh, the population is predominantly Asian. Uh, however, I think in times of crisis, we always come together. Um, I, was, um, I, was, I had the opportunity to be a part of a, um, a rally 
um, that brought together faith leaders, uh, civic activists, and local residents on the steps of Queens uh, Public Library in downtown Flushing. Uh, we were taking a stand uh, uh, it, uh, to unify um, our commitment to stand with our, our, our uh, Asian American brothers and sisters uh, as they are being attacked. Uh, this event was organized by John Cho, uh, the executive director of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we had other people um, attendance there. Uh, we had Julie A. Kim um, from the Asian American Feminist Co uh, Collective. We had So Young Lee Segredo. She's a member of the Greater Flushing Chamber of Commerce. Uh, she also represents the Korean American Association of Queens um, and the Multicultural Council of New York. Uh, I was there representing the Amy Church. Uh, you also had uh, Rabbi Rachel, uh, Rachel Goldenberg, uh, who represented the Mohawk uh, Jewish Spiritual Community of Queens. And you had other district leaders, uh, such as uh, Martha Flores, uh, Valquez, uh, and others. Um, we gathered together on the steps of Queens uh, Public Library to mourn the lives lost through the mass shooting in Atlanta to condemn white supremacy uh, and racism dividing our country and, and really to make a stand of solidarity across race, religion and gender lines uh, in mutual support uh, and protection against future attacks of violence. Um, you know, communi communities must speak out against bigotry. We must speak out against racism, uh, misogyny, uh, xenophobia and other racist uh, or discriminatory acts wherever and whenever we, we find it. Uh, I'm pleased to be a part of the, you mentioned in my resume, in, in my bio about the uh, Ministerial Alliance. Well, the Ministerial Alliance is working with uh, Congressman Grace Means' office on a, another panel discussion um, with, uh, with clergy from the African-American perspective, uh, as well as Asian-American and Pacific Islanders. Uh, clergy coming together to see what else we can do um, in, 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 this, in this difficult time. Uh, I believe that we, sh we need to continue to build these types of coalitions and condemn violence and hatred against not only Asian Americans, but uh, Pacific Islanders, African Americans, Latinx, Jews, Muslims, as we, as we have talked about uh, in this discussion. And we need to let society know that this is just not acceptable and, and must not be tolerated. I think second, we need to educate our young people. Um, we need to educate the adults as well, but I think young people, I, I don't want us to lose sight of what young people are going through. Um, uh, as you saw, a lot of young people uh, uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think, I think we need to educate our young people because they are being bullied. Uh, they're hearing the Asian, um, uh, anti-Asian rhetoric. Uh, they're being bullied in school. Um, they're, they're being impacted by these hate crimes. Um, and this is an opportunity that I believe that we have to have these meaningful conversations with our young people and to interrupt any xenophobia uh, or xenophobic uh, narratives that they're, that they're out there. Our young people mu must be, uh, you know, they need to uh, learn about our history on both sides of the equation. Um, and they need to, you know, they're responding to social media, which is, which is a whole new um, way of life for, for those of us who are uh, over a certain age. But but they are getting bombarded by, uh, bombarded by social media posts. And so we need to really uh, educate and, and um, our young people to make sure that they are uh, expressing their concerns, their anger, their frustration um, about what is going on in our society. And, and lastly, let me just end with this, that we must hold elected officials accountable. Uh, the, the anti-Asian rhetoric of the former um, administration uh, in connection with COVID-19 pandemic has fueled this verbal attacks um, throughout the country. Um, and, and not only verbal, but now we see this now becoming physical. Uh, so we must hold our elected officials accountable. 
those who are promoting uh, hatred and division or doing very little to speak against it. You know, being silent it speaks a lot. So we must let them know that they cannot be silent, that they must speak out against it, uh, and that their, their inaction to do anything um, is not acceptable and cannot be uh, tolerated. Um, a quote that I read from uh, an article, uh, this person said, we have to start to see people as human beings because, of, because our entire humanity depends on it. So, you know, I, I think, you know, there's a lot that can be said, a lot to be done here. Uh, I think we need to continue to have this type of dialogue so that people are aware. I, I agree that we don't own, I, look, there's a lot of history in this country and we need to know our history uh, from the African-American perspective, from the Asian-American perspective, Pacific Islanders perspective. I think Cam, you, you mentioned it, you, you said it best when you mentioned um, uh, Kamala Harris. I mean, she's a Pacific Islander, which we don't look at. And so there's a lot of stereotypes out there. There's a, we have been damaged in this country in the last couple of years. Uh, and it's going to take some time to rebuild this. But I think through, as, as a clergy, think through prayer and seeking God's direction, I think we can get there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the work that you're doing so far. You brought up really important points about, um, you know, tolerance and the consequences of staying silent, but also, you know, acknowledging um, other people you know, their identities, but also what their path was like and what it means to be in solidarity with other people as well. Um, I'd like to pivot to, um, we have two guest speakers from our employee relations team. We have Simon, who is the AVP of employee relations and Michael, who is the director of fair employment practices. Um, we do have Northwell internal resources for team members, but we also have it for our family members as well to seek assistance or report any incidents that they have either been directly affected by or may have witnessed. Um, so Simon and Mike, I'll let you take it away to talk about some of these resources that we have here at Northwell. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for inviting us to uh, join today's event. Just wanna quickly check that I'm coming across clear. Everyone hear me all right? Seeing that, thank you. Yep. So uh, again, um, Mike McCord with our Fair Employment Practices Group in the Human Resources Department. Uh, this is a topic that, of course, is central to really all of the work uh, leaders in human resources does for the organization. But for today's event, uh, I just want to quickly thank the Bridges African American and Caribbean and Asian Berg uh, for organizing. The Bergs are an amazing resource and a fantastic group of folks helping to advocate on a wide variety of important issues. Uh, and uh, communities. And it uh, continues to be an integral component um, of, of this strategy. I also want to echo uh, some of the sentiments from Maxine Carrington, our Chief Human Resources Officer, you know, that events like this and the, uh, the, the values are central to uh, our vision to deliver world renowned team member experience, driving a culture of innovation, inclusivity and well-being to empower our teams to redefine the future of healthcare. Uh, we're dedicated to supporting the total well-being of our team, uh, and we continue to identify equity, diversity, and, and inclusion as core elements of that, closely aligned with our culture of care, employee promise, and our values. So as we recognize and celebrate, uh, we also want to highlight some of the resources, uh, education, uh, and policy that underlie it. As so many of our speakers today called out, um, uh, educating is an important component of this by creating an environment of belonging and allyship uh, where team members are encouraged and comfortable bringing their whole self to work. Uh, we, we enhance our ability to support uh, the patients and communities that entrust us with our care. So just from a policy perspective, we of course, uh, safety, being supported, being an ally is critical. Uh, North law is a strict policy prohibiting discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, and any discriminatory or harassment behavior uh, should be promptly reported. All reports will be uh, timely investigated. 
In the workplace, of course, also your local site security, workforce safety, law enforcement when appropriate are available. But we also wanna talk about uh, some of the resources that are available to help leaders and team members on uh, their equity, diversity, and inclusion journey. You may uh, have seen some of these supports advertised in recent town halls and in other system forms, uh, but we encourage uh, you to take them back to your teams and review as you prioritize this topic and support ongoing dialogue with your teams and colleagues. These are resources like our Inclusion Academy, a site featuring learning and development offerings supporting our commitment to advance a culture of trust and safety, our Racial Equity Resource Center, maintained by Northwell Center of Equity of Care, uh, which affirms our commitment to racial justice and related content to support, uh, including Northwell Town Halls, conversation guides to help facilitate dialogue and steps to make sure that those conversations continue, as well as assorted trainings, reading, articles, TED Talks uh, to help advance your own personal learning. And then finally, as it relates to our total well-being, uh, please, please take advantage of the wide variety that our Total Rewards team curates. Things like our well-being and behavioral health resources, a well-being page that curates and pulls together links to all of these, which we will make sure is circulated after today's session. Things like our Employee and Family Assistance Program, which is available to uh, all Northwell team members and their families for uh, intervention resources. It's a great starting place and there's no shortage of uh, other links related to your benefits and resiliency. And of course, your managers, supervisors, human resources are always there as available resource. Please feel free to reach out to the HR Service Center if you want any additional information or help connecting with some of these great resources. And if you should experience an event at work, again, we encourage you to please report. Our employee relations team and, uh, and our site human resources representatives uh, will be glad to support you. I know we're at the top of the hour, Simon. Uh, is there anything else uh, you would like to add? I don't think I saw any additional questions come in over the chat. Yeah, Mike, uh, thanks for that uh, that overview. I'll put my video on, hi everybody. Um, the only other thing I'd say in addition is that um, th this is an issue that um, we as an organization take very seriously. And I know uh, for the people who are Northwell employees on this, uh, on the Zoom call, they may recall seeing an email from Michael Dowling. They went to all employees really denouncing the unconscionable uh, discrimination and harassment against the AAPI um, uh, population. Um, and also uh, emphasizing, in addition to those internal resources, um, reaching out to law enforcement or uh, contacting New York State's and I just want to make sure I get the name uh, correct, the New York State Hate Crime Task Force, which you can reach on their website to report things or use their phone number to contact them as well. Um, but uh, I think other than that, Mikey gave a great summary of our internal resources. And, and thank you everyone for giving us a platform to talk about this. Thank you, Michael and Simon for these important, useful resources for us. Um, so this concludes our panel discussion today on learning the history of AAPIs and building solidarity through allyship. These conversations will continue through various um, Berg programs, events, and initiatives organized by our Berg leaders um, and CEC and HR. But if you're not a member, please sign up through my experience by clicking on the Berg application. If you are a member, encourage your colleagues to join, your, your bosses, your friends to join as well so they can engage in these conversations and events as well. Um, I just want to say thank you to CEC, uh, HR, our Congresswoman Grace, Dr. Cam, uh, Reverend Dr. Richard, and my co-moderator, Dr. Myers, uh, for your time and for making this panel discussion really useful and such an important and insightful conversation for all of us. Um, thank you to Andrea, Neela, Emmy, Richard, Ralph, if you guys want to come on camera and say hi, uh, Michelle, Jordana, thank you all for your help, Chandler, 
Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for tuning in today in celebration of AEPI Heritage Month. Um, and we hope to see you at future events. Have a great day. Thank you. Enjoyed it.